Hi, it's Sandra Brown with the Institute for Relational Harm Reduction and Public Pathology Education. I'm also the current president of the Association for Narcissistic Personality Disorder and Psychopathy Survivor Treatment. It's an association for therapist training. Um, this is a series that I've done, that I've been doing and uh, I would suggest that you start with um, the, fir the first one, which is the introduction, which is called uh, Intro, What I Meant. Uh, the first talk is about the history of narcissistic abuse field. The second talk was um, who is teaching you about narcissistic abuse. Um, the next talk, the third talk was on no contact. The fourth talk was, it's not just about no contact, it's about disengagement. And, th and this uh, uh, talk, we're going to get into another topic. So the reason that I'm doing this, um, which is explained in a lot more detail in the video that is about the history of the narcissistic abuse field, is that it was my books that came out um, um, oh, well over a decade ago um, that were the first books that talked about the cluster B personality disorder and psychopathy intimate relationship and what the dynamics were and what the traits of the survivors were that were that were being targeted, that we actually did um, three different uh, data collection surveys and a full blown collegiate university um, research project with Purdue University to find that out. And the books also discuss the unique trauma and how this trauma, while a, a lot of it is similar, uh, because a lot of the survivors have PTSD, so a lot of it is similar to PTSD, that there's also um, unique features to uh, this trauma that's often misdiagnosed. So the latest book is this one. This is the third edition um, and it contains uh, 422 pages, whole lot of our information um, that we've collected uh, all the way back to when I began working with survivors uh, of narcissists and psychopaths um, 30 some years ago. So field's not new, um, just the awarenesses. And um, so anyway, uh, because of that awareness and, and the field has really um, uh, grown a lot and but mostly um, the voices out there are survivor bloggers um, that um, have read other survivor blogger um, books without ever really reading this book, which is um, <laughs> the one that has all the real data in it um, and the real science in it. And so what's happening is we're getting, you know, a lot of wrong information. And the reason that's important is because uh, you, the survivor that is looking for this information to build um, your recovery off of and an understanding of what you have been through, it matters if it's correct. And so the series was created to correct a lot of stuff out there that I feel responsible for. Um, as the person that wrote the first book about this, I don't know how it's gotten so off track, but but it has. So um, so the series has been to um, to get back to the uh, sort of a theory correction um, and redirecting our understanding to what we really do know 
um, from our research, from our science, um, from 30 years in the field, what's real and what is just horseshit, honestly, um, that's being taught to you. So, um, so these, the, the series has been um, focused on um, what I meant when I started this field and the things that I never said, uh, I never meant, I never wrote. And wherever they came from, <laughs> um, it, it didn't come from me. So today, the topic um, that I'm disclaiming is uh, the whole issue about empaths and codependency so everybody has you know their the thing that makes their blood pressure rise and that's mine <laughs> so um and the reason that it makes my blood pressure rise is because we spent i've spent 30 years with survivors you know noticing the difference in their personality. That's really what got me on this search um, for the truth about these survivors. And um, that their personalities were very different than even just like the, the typical domestic violence profile that the DV field sort of creates about um, the typical survivor. And so 30 years ago, when I began seeing these mostly women, um, it, that, that did not fit. And so for 30 years, I've been um, you know, keeping notes um, on the similarities of their personalities. And all I had was my own experience for that. And I had this big whiteboard in my office and, and it looked sort of like an electrical diagram. On there I had like the relationship dynamics as I was working with that and always changing and modifying it. And then on this other side, I had this ongoing theory and personality traits um, consistent traits, personality traits of these women. And I kept, you know, working with it over decades and decades with this. And then um, in this book, um, we actually utilized um, a survey, a, a personality temperament survey called the um, TCI the temperament character inventory. And it was a small um, sample of 75 women, but it was enough for me to see, am I on the right track from decades ago, this list that I've been keeping and that I've been adding to and tweaking and thinking about, you know, is, Am I anywhere close to reality on this? And so the TCI helped deliver um, the first look at, yeah, I'm onto something here. And so, but the size was too small for it to really be, um, you know, taken um, real seriously. And it, and it wasn't done through, uh, the way that you do um, collegiate type research. But it was enough for me. It, it began, uh, um, it lit a fire under me to keep going to understand this. Because this, the, my clients, you know, were coming to me after being with other therapists who heard the relationship dynamics, this, this crazy ass, chaotic, dramatic, 
you know, up and down relationship dynamics and then saw her, um, her diligence in the relationship and concluded that she was, um, you know, codependent or maybe even she had a pathological uh, personality disorder like dependent personality disorder. And so, so many of these women um, kept telling me the same story. And so um, that's what made me, you know, continue to um, keep detailed information, you know, about this. And so um, then when this book came out in 2009, I believe it was, um, I began um, working with some other survey type models um, and gathering more information about the survivor's personality. It was clear to me um, they didn't fit the domestic violence standard profile. Uh, they didn't fit a codependency profile, uh, code, true codependency is debilitating um, and affects a lot of areas of life, even career success. Um, and so would um, a person who had um, dependency, like a dependent personality disorder. And, but my, cl my clients were, were judges, surgeons, doctors, um, an air traffic controller, a city transportation director. Could you really rise to that level um, of success being crippled and held hostage by dependency or even codependency? So to me, that was just, you know, complete bunk. And it was lazy on therapist's part to just you know, send them off, you know, by the truckload to code a meeting. And um, I didn't happen, you know, to agree with that. And then in this book, um, the reason it's so, one of the reasons it's so thick is, is that by that time, I had gone searching for um, someone who would take this theory um, seriously, even though uh, we only had that small study of 75 people with the uh, TCI. So I went knocking on research, you know, college research uh, doors and um, found somebody at Purdue University in their psychology department. Um, that was willing to take a chance on this. And so um, we utilized um, two different assessments and um, plus this very extensive um, history. Uh, one of the things I wanted to look at was this assumption about codependency is based on the belief um, or whatever, there's not really a codependency theory because codependency is a pop psychology thing. It's not, it's not in the DSM. So whatever the codependency survivor books um, about that. And so the assumption about that is that codependency is generated in childhood from dysfunctional families, whether the parents are chronically mentally ill, maybe um, the child grew up, you know, with somebody that had schizophrenia, or maybe untreated bipolar, maybe a parent had a pathological cluster B disorder, maybe they were narcissistic, antisocial, psychopathic, Maybe uh, one or two or both parents had addiction or, you know, alcoholism or drug addiction. Maybe they had a combination of that. Maybe there was a problem sibling, 
Maybe they were molested. Maybe there was domestic violence in the home. But the whole idea of this codependency thing is this learned behavior and some type of dysfunctional um, environment. And so that was the thing, you know, I told Purdue about that the reason these people are being diagnosed codependent um, is this assumption about their early childhood. And so that's why they're being sent to CODA meetings. <clears throat> and it, it was not my um, experience across the board that all my clients had those kinds of uh, adversive childhood experiences or dysfunctional childhood experiences because over half of my clients claim to have had normal enough childhoods. So if the reason in other therapists' minds were that the reason these women were ending up in relationships with cluster B and psychopaths was because of this dysfunctional family issue, then that history would be predominant. If that's the reason that they're getting into these relationships is because of dependency or codependency um, or something like that, these adversive childhoods, then that's going to be the predominant thing that we see. But I didn't see it. That's not the histories the women were giving me. So lots of therapists assumed, oh, uh, they've repressed their abuse memories. They really were abused and they don't know it. They really did have alcoholic parents, but they didn't know it. Um, so, uh, I didn't buy that either. <laughs> so, um, so the thing, you know, that was, that was unlooked at, the thing that was consistent, you know, in this population is that everybody has a personality. Um, and considering that they were with a partner that had a personality disorder. And we know all about that. We know about how personality in a personality disorder causes people to behave. That's what we know about, you know, narcissistic uh, and uh, psychopathic abuse. We know the behaviors associated that are generated from the personality. So what about, the, what about survivors' personalities? Not that they are on a bell curve um, and looking at personality, that they are way over here like personality disorders are, but is there something a little different in their personality? that might give us a clue why a personality disorder and this personality um, tend, tend to have to en end up together. And so since, um, since all the survivors did not have codependency, but all the survivors have a personality, <laughs> it was, the only thing that I could see in commonality to begin to look at. And so at, at Purdue, that's one of the things I really wanted to make sure that we had a very extensive part uh, of um, the research dedicated to a deep look at their um, histories. And so that's what we did. Um, we got a lot of information uh, on their previous mental health, 
before they got into this relationship? Did they have other problems? Were, were they chronically um, you know, depressed or anxious or, or have some kind of disorder? Um, did they have low self-esteem before this relationship? Uh, which is associated with codependency. Did they struggle their whole, you know, life with um, issues related to not being able to speak up for themselves? Um, did they have, uh, what was the mental health um, in their family? Were there people that, siblings or parents or grandparents that had had a history of, of some type of mental illness that ran in the family. Uh, addictions, herself or family, siblings, all of that. So we spent, we really dug in there because not only were we looking for if there were personality elevations or differences in her personality that might account for kind of that magnet um, attraction with somebody with a very different kind of personality. But was there um, the issues that other people were assuming about them, that they um, were codependent or dependent or had previous trauma, and the reason that they were um, picking these relationships is because they had untreated trauma. Um, they were addicts, they were relationship addicts, they were borderline personality disorder. So there were all these, you know, um, assumptions about that. So we got this really big, you know, history on them. And then we used two different instruments and um, so that we checked and then double checked. And so the two instruments plus the TCI that we had done um, years ago were, was three instruments in which on all three instruments that the results were the same. And I think the Purdue researcher called it something like um, unbelie unbelievably consistent. So that so what we found out, um, and uh, I don't have time in this uh, video to go into all of that, but the the overall findings in a 600 person uh, research, which is huge, that, that, that's a bit big number that they were really happy with. And this unbelievable consistency across the board shows that th these people are, were not codependent, that, that 60 some percent of them did not have the aversive early childhood um, dysfunctional uh, families that produced um, codependency, that only 30 some percent of them uh, had something that might have contributed. And just because uh, one of the things we found out in, um, in the research about their personality traits, um, that they have these really good, strong, um, specific traits, it is that even for those that had um, some adversity in their um, earlier life, that their personalities were so strong in these areas that a lot of times that did not produce codependency or even trauma. And so the, the, the idea, you know, that the majority 
of survivors have codependency, the opposite is actually true, that only 30 some percent of them had it. And even with aversive situations, they did not show the typical um, symptoms or behaviors, behaviors, not symptoms, behaviors of codependency, even when they did have the aversive childhood because of these two personality trait elevations um, that really helped give them resiliency. So before you, you know, um, go and believe in the articles out there about narcissists and codependence, which has no research behind it. We have 10 years of research behind it that says that's not what's happening. And we have um, a really good explanation for it. And I have done a um, three free three-part series on these traits, these personality traits, and we've nicknamed them super traits um, because the survivors have these in the high normal range. It is not a personality disorder. Um, it's just two traits that, that are higher than normal and um, do some interesting things in the hands of um, antagonistic and abusive um, cluster Bs and psychopaths. Nowhere else has these two trait elevations been a problem. So if you wanna hear that, um, what those elevations are, um, it's two traits with 14 facets associated with each trait. And so it's not just about empathy either. That whole empath thing makes me crazy too. So one of the facets under a trait, one tra 14 facets make up this trait. And one of the facets, <laughs> one of the facets um, was empathy. But there's 13 other facets in this trait, and there's 14 other facets in this trait that survivors need to be aware of. It's not just empathy that's elevated in you. And it, those 13 other um, facets are just as operational um, in, uh, in the relationship and our reasons for why disengagement out of the relationship was so difficult. So you need to know those and stop with the empath thing, stop with the codependency thing. There's not one bit of science. If you care, you know, if you don't care about science, then, then this won't mean anything to you. Um, but if you really care to know um, what we have found three times um, in three different instruments consistently over 10 years, Go to the website, saferelationshipsmagazine.com. Um, on the right-hand side um, is an audio that is called Super Traits of Personality. There are numerous chapters in here, um, actually probably a third of this book goes into great detail, more than what I could go into on that audio about um, every one of those facets and how it played out in your relationship dynamic, why it's significant in your trauma presentation, and why it's your risk factor for future um, cluster B partners if you don't uh, work, work with that aspect um, with somebody that knows what they're doing with that aspect of your personality. So um, go by and listen to that and then um, read, read the chapters in here. Um, and and these, one, one of these traits had a lot to do 
with um, your inconsistent intuition. That's a whole other thing that I see out there. Trust your gut thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a talk on that because um, that's not what we found out either. So uh, keep coming back if you're interested um, in the real science uh, of um, the narcissistic abuse field and how you can um, know how to utilize people that really understand um, understand this. And I know a lot of survivors have been, um, you know, lost a lot of valuable time and stabilization by, uh, you know, going to some of these uh, blogger sites that um, might be a survivor and have had their own experience with it, but um, haven't um, been the ones that have, you know, produced 30 years of information. So anyway, um, thank you for joining me and um, I'll be back next time. And I think we will talk about that issue of um, inconsistent intuition, which is also in the book. Our, our um, website is saferelationshipsmagazine.com and our Facebook um, page, which is a trauma-informed, safe for survivors, you won't be triggered um, page is the Institute for Relational Harm Reduction. So thanks for joining me. I'm Sandra Brown with the